Hello everyone, my name is Jacob Forster. Today I talk to you about learning with opponent learning awareness. This work was produced with a, uh, in collaboration with my fantastic collaborators across the University of Oxford, CMU, and OpenAI. There's a large number of reasons to care about multi-agent learning. For a start, the entire world is full of multi-agent problems. It doesn't matter if you think about cars in the road, the Internet of Things, or drones in the sky. In all of these settings, a large number of different agents has to take decentralized actions based on local observations in order to achieve a common goal. However, while it's fantastic to solve practical problems, this is not my primary motivation for working on multi-agent problems. I believe that multi-agent learning is one of the key components for building intelligent systems. This belief is partially grounded in evidence coming from biology. For example, as shown in this plot, if you look at the ratio of the brain that's occupied by the neocortex, an area of the brain that's responsible for higher cognitive abilities, we can see that this correlates extremely strongly with the mean group size in non-human primates, as shown on the left. This suggests, in a nutshell, that the human ability of doing abstract thinking, of thinking at a high level and so on, does not exist in order to uh, find fruit or escape from predators. It exists in contrast in order to resolve the challenges that emerge when we interact in social groups that consist of other intelligent agents. My research agenda has been to study these multi-agent settings using reinforcement learning and to address the challenges that arise. However, I want to keep in mind that the long-term goal here is to build the most capable learning agent possible. And I think of multi-age learning as the important stepping stone in that direction. However, uh, before we address these lofty goals, let's do a brief refresher on some of the tools that we will be, will be using in this process. First of all, reinforcement learning, RL also. RL is a setting in which an agent, and shown on the left, the robot, interacts with the environment shown on the right. At each time step, the environment produces an observation, O, and reward R, which the agent processes in order to select an action U, which is then sent to, to the environment. When receiving this action U, the environment carries out a state transition, which you can think of as being the next screen being produced in a computer game. The goal of the agent is to interact with this environment and choose actions which maximize the total expected return per episode, which is shown at the bottom. This is nothing but the sum of rewards multiplied by a discount factor. Now you may ask, why do we discount future returns? And one answer is, we just like to have our points faster. Still, if I ask you, would you rather have $5 today or in 100 years? Most of us would prefer the $5 now. The second answer is, we're uncertain about the future. Who knows what will happen in 100 years? Let's rather have the points now. Shown at the bottom is the definition of the expected return it's also referred to as the value function. And this V will be relevant later in the presentation. However, we haven't specified how we actually map from observations into actions. That's called the policy. Recently, one particular type of policy has become very popular. And this is called deep reinforcement learning. In DeepRL, the agent is parameterized by a deep neural network, which takes in the observation from the agent, processes it through a number of layers, and then produces a probability distribution over, over actions. However, as we said, we will be using multi-agent reinforcement learning, so one simple agent isn't enough in our setting. Instead, we'll have an environment which contains a number of different agents, here uh, illustrated by the blue agent, the red agent, and the green agent. Importantly, while each agent receives their own observation, O, and their own reward, R, and takes their own action, U, what happens in the game, i.e. the transition probabilities for the next state, conditions on the actions of all of the agents. This means that the return that an agent receives, for example, the blue agent, is not just a function of this agent, but also a function of the actions that all other agents are taking at the same time. As you can imagine, this leads to a number of challenges that occur in multi-agent settings. For example, agents may need to learn to communicate. We did a paper on this at NIPS 2016, 
where we actually had agents that could learn to discover communication protocols. But also because all the other agents in the environment are learning, the environment now appears to be changing or non-stationary from the perspective of any given agent. We published work on this at ICML in 2017. Furthermore, if you've ever done any group sports or interacted in teams, clearly sometimes it's unclear what every individual player is contributing to the success of the team. This is called the credit assignment problem, which occurs in multi-agent settings. And we published work on this using a counterfactual baseline that tries to tease out the contribution of the individual agent to the overall team reward. However, in all of these problem cases, we've still assumed that all agents are cooperating towards a common goal. In this paper, we'll be looking at the question of reciprocity. The motivation for this is that really the top left picture of these cars was somewhat misleading. We both know that cars on the road do not consist of a homogenous cooperating group of entities trying to achieve a common goal. Instead, real-world traffic looks much more like what's shown on the right. This is, by the way, from Tel Aviv. In reality, traffic consists of a large number of different agents, each trying to achieve their own goal, leading to conflicting interests. For example, you can see that the yellow car is, cutting, is being cut by the silver car on the road. Each driver tries to get to the destination as soon as possible. Now, the reason that we don't observe more chaos or conflict on the road itself is that humans are surprisingly good at establishing cooperation in settings of conflicting interest. In this work, we'll be asking the question, what happens when we unleash deep reinforced learning algorithms in setting of conflicting interest, and how can we fix some of the drastic failure cases that emerge when we do so? However, before we get there, let's start out by reviewing one of the most basic and fundamental learning methods in multi-agent learning. This is called naive learning or also independent learning. As shown on the slide, we have two agents, Alice on the left in blue and Bob on the right in red. Alice is parameterized by theta one and Bob by theta two. As discussed before, because these agents interact in the same environment, the return for Alice V1 is a function both of theta one, but also of theta two. In naive learning, Alice maximizes her return as a function of her policy theta one. This seems like a very reasonable thing to do since theta one is the only thing that Alice can directly change. And Bob vice versa is doing the same thing. Importantly, they're assuming that their opponent is a static part of the environment. We can picturize this by looking at a scenario whereby Alice imagines an augmented environment that consists of the original environment plus a static copy of the opponent, Bob, indicated by delta theta two being zero, i.e. the parameter update being assumed to be non-existent. At the same time, Bob is doing exactly the same thing for Alice. And obviously, this seems like a good idea because both agents are trying to maximize their return. Because we're doing reinforcement learning, we cannot assume access to the true value function, the true expected return, and the gradient thereof. Instead, we have to rely on the current estimates of the parameters and the current gradients, rather than being able to maximize globally across parameters. Because no one is giving us this function, it only exists as an, expected, as an expectation of returns when interacting with the environment using samples. So in gradient-based learning, Alice is updating her policy in the direction of the gradient of the return with respect to theta one. The gradient being nothing but the direction of steepest ascent of the function V1 with respect to the parameters theta one of Alice. Importantly, again, we're here assuming that theta two Bob's parameters are static and are not a function of Alice's policy. And Bob is doing exactly the same with Alice. And we will see how this assumption, this false assumption that there's no interaction between the policies can lead to dramatic failure cases. We will address those failure cases using the new method, learning with opponent learning awareness, or short LOLA. In LOLA, both Alice and Bob assume that they are playing against an environment which includes not a static copy of the opponent, but a learning copy of the opponent. Now Alice is aware that Bob is also a learning agent. Specifically, Alice is modeling Bob's learning dynamics by assuming that Bob is a naive learner. Naive learner being, as we said before, 
the agent that follows the gradient, i.e. tries to maximize their own return by updating their policy. And Bob on the right-hand side is doing exactly the same. Now, importantly, because Bob's learning step is a function of Alice's parameters, the augmented environment that contains the naive learner, the naive learning opponent, is now a function of Alice's policy. And that's indicated by the blue shading under the augmented environment that consists of the naive learner plus the static environment. Mathematically, we can model this by looking at a new return function, which is the return of Alice V1, but anticipating the parameter update delta theta 2 of Bob. In particular, when we rely on local, local information, such as the estimate and the gradient, we can expand this expected return after learning step in a Taylor expansion. And this new return is nothing but the original return V1 at the current parameters plus the gradient of the return with respect to theta 2 times delta theta 2, the learning step of Bob. And importantly, we're assuming that Bob is a naive learner as indicated by delta theta 2 being the gradient of the value function with respect to Bob's parameters. Now, because we're doing gradient-based learning on this new objective, we have to differentiate through the expected return V1 after one step of learning. And this leads to the Lola learning rule. In the, the Lola learning rule, as shown in the bottom of the slide, consists of two terms. The first term captures how the return of Alice depends on Alice's policy directly. It's the gradient of V1 with respect to theta1. That's just naive learning. However, we also get a second term. And this second term arises because we've differentiated through Bob's learning step, which we said was a function of Alice's policy with respect to Alice's policy. And we're now multiplying how Alice can change the learning step of Bob weighted by how much Alice's return depends on Bob's learning step. So this term corresponds to Alice trying to update her parameters in order to influence Bob's learning outcome, which will then lead to higher returns in the future. This is a shaping term. Here, Alice is really considering the impact of her policy on the learning of the opponent, which is a novel term and leads to drastically different outcomes in multi-agent learning. If you find this still confusing, let's look at the pictorial representation of what's happening here. The new return consists of the original return plus the Taylor expansion. And the Taylor expansion is nothing but a dot product. We're taking a, a product between two vectors here, delta theta 2, the learning step of the opponent, dotted in an inner product with a gradient of the value function of V1 with respect to theta 2. This tells us how much Alice is going to gain or lose when Bob is learning. And what Alice tries to do, Alice tries to increase that value. Now, obviously, what this means, because it's a dot product, Alice effectively tries to align the learning set that Bob has taken with her own, with her own incentive, which is the gradient. So Alice tries to increase the inner product corresponding to reducing the angle between the gradient of the value function of Bob's parameter and the learning step that Bob is going to take in the next move. At this point in time, if you have any questions to do this method, I think it would be good to post them quickly Because if it's unclear now, it will probably not get any clearer. OK, it seems like so far we don't have any questions to do with the method, which means either I'm explaining myself too well or nothing is, nothing is making sense. Good, so so far there's two open challenges. While this is fantastic, in principle, we have assumed in this derivation that we have access to the true value function and the gradient of everyone involved in the game. Furthermore, we also assume that we have access to the true parameters of all agents in the game. And these two assumptions will be relaxed in the rest of the presentation. In order to do so, let's first understand how we can estimate the gradient of a, of a, of a, of a, of a distribution when we have to differentiate through the probability distribution. Shown here is a simple example whereby we're estimating the average of a function f of x and theta 
where x is summed from the probability distribution p of x parameterized by theta. And we're trying to estimate the gradient of this expectation with respect to theta. The first thing we'll do is we will rewrite this as a sum over x, p of x and theta times f of x. And we'll then use the product rule to produce two terms. The second term here is p of x times grad theta f of x. And this term obviously can be estimated just fine because we can sample x from p of x and simply evaluate the average of grad theta f of x and theta. However, the first term is a problem because we cannot sample from grad theta p of x and theta. Instead, we have to rewrite this term grad theta p of x and theta as p of x times grad theta log p of x. And now we're in a good shape because we've produced two terms which can be written of the form p of x times blah. And we can clearly sample x from p of x We can clearly sample x from p of x and evaluate f of x times grad theta log p and grad theta f. This is called the score function estimator. It's going to provide, on average, an expectation of the, on average, it will evaluate to the exact uh, gradient of our expectation with respect to theta. Now, I just received some comments that and apparently the explanation of Lola was not very clear. So I'll go back and provide one more uh, attempt at providing intuition here for everyone. So let's contrast what we had in naive learning. In naive learning, the agents imagine that the opponent is a static part of the environment, which means that at any moment, they are taking a gradient step. Alice is taking a gradient step to improve her own return, assuming Bob is static. However, that assumption is wrong because we know that in fact, both agents in naive learning are indeed updating their policies. Because in naive learning, both Alice and Bob are updating their parameters in order to improve the expected return. That's shown on these slides. That's shown on these slides. So what you can see is that in naive learning, both agents are in fact updating their policies in order to increase the total return. However, in learning with opponent learning awareness, we now model the learning of our opponents by directly assuming that the opponent is a naive learner. This means that rather than just change the return by updating theta one, theta one will also update, have an impact on the learning step of the opponent. So let's do this in math. I think this slide really, if you get, get, can get this slide, then you have come a long way because this is the crux, right? Alice, shown on the left, is assuming that Bob is going to carry out the learning step delta theta 2. This learning step is the gradient of the value function of Bob, the expected return, with respect to Bob's parameters. Alice can now optimize a new objective, which is the value function d1, Alice's value function, after one step of opponent learning. And that's expressed by looking at the new value function d1 of theta1, but theta2 plus delta theta2, where we're anticipating the learning step of the opponent bar. However, because we do not have access to the value function at all points, we have to approximate the value at theta1 and theta two plus delta theta two using what's called a Taylor expansion. In the Taylor expansion, we're expressing the term of x plus delta x as the value at x plus delta x times to first order the gradient of f with respect to x. And that's shown at the bottom. So here we've approximated the value function after Bob has updated his parameters as being the sum of two terms. as being the sum of two terms, being the term of the naive learner d1, but also the inner product of the gradient of the value function respect to Bob's parameters, weighted by the learning step of Bob. And this will lead, when we differentiate through this, to two different terms, one of them being the naive learning step, which is just the gradient that any naive learner takes, but also the change of Bob's learning step differentiated with respect to others' policy, weighted by the dependency 
of Alice's return on Bob's policy. And I just got a question coming in here, if this wouldn't make the algorithm converge more slowly. In fact, what we'll find is that this improves the conversion properties in a number of games and can lead to uh, much more interesting outcomes in multi agent settings. Looking at the slide again, I hope this now makes more sense. We have the gradient of Alice's value function with respect to Bob's parameters, which gets multiplied in a dot product with a learning step of Bob. And the Lola agent tries to make sure that these two vectors point in the same direction because the, the overlap between these two vectors is how much Alice will benefit from Bob's learning step. And thank you for the questions coming in. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. I, ho I hope this clarified the point so far. So coming back to the score function estimator, if you don't like math, you can skip this. But this is basically how we can differentiate through expectations. And I just had another question come in. Are the agents aware of each other's learning step? That's exactly what we said here with the challenges before. So far, we've assumed that the agents have access to the true value function and the gradients and also the parameters of all the other agents. And these are assumptions we will be relaxing over the rest of the talk if we get to those parts of the presentation. Fantastic. So now that we know how to estimate the first order gradient using samples by interacting with the environment, it turns out we can apply the same trick twice to estimate all the terms needed for our Lola method without having access to the true value function. We can estimate those terms using samples by interacting with the environment. In particular, the Lola learning rule consists of the naive learning rule, which is just a policy gradient shown here that we derived on the previous slide, but also an additional term, which consists of second order derivative. And luckily, it turns out that we can estimate the second order derivatives using uh, policy gradient methods by applying the same trick I showed you in the previous slide just twice. This leads to an impression down here where we're basically summing over time and we're weighting the graph theta log probabilities by the uh, returns produced at different time steps. And it turns out that this is a method that is exact in expectation, although it can lead to an increase in variance when we're doing this rather than using the exact value function. In order to test this method, it turns out we don't have to go and simulate cars or traffic on the road because economists have come up with what, with what is the prisoner's dilemma. In the prisoner's dilemma, Alice and Bob have been caught robbing a bank and they're being interrogated separately. The police is asking each of them whether or not their partner robbed the bank. And the police is smart. They set up a scheme such that if both Alice and Bob cooperate with each other, i.e. they remain silent, they get one year in prison. However, both Alice and Bob are incentivized to blame their partner on robbing the bank because they will get one year less in prison. That's shown in the right-hand side in the payoff matrix. Shown is the action of Alice where defecting corresponds to telling on Bob and cooperating corresponds to remaining silent. So for example, if you look at the quadrant that has minus two, minus two, this will correspond to two years in prison if both Alice and Bob defect against their partner. In contrast, if they both remain silent, either they cooperated, both Alice and Bob would spend one year in prison. However, it turns out that no matter what Bob is doing, Alice will always save herself one year in prison by defecting against Bob. And therefore, there's only one Nash equilibrium in this setting. A Nash equilibrium being a set of strategies whereby neither agent can improve the return by changing the strategy. And that Nash equilibrium is to defect against the partner. So in the single shot game, where Alice and Bob get caught only once, there's only one answer to this, which is for both agents to tell that their partner robbed the bank and therefore they'll spend two years in prison. However, when Alice and Bob decide to rob the bank every single day and get caught every single day, this corresponds to the iterated prison dilemma. And this is a very popular uh, game to study in game theory. It is known that in the iterated game, because Alice and Bob can observe the previous action their partner took, there's a large number of different Nash equilibria. In particular, there's one Nash equilibrium called tit for tat, which corresponds to Alice and Bob 
doing on the next day what their partner did on the previous day. So an Asian plaintiff for that will cooperate on the first day, but then on the previous day, on the next day, do what their partner did on the, on the previous day. And this proved very successful in a tournament that was organized by Axelrod, where he scripted different bots against each other, and Tit for Tat emerged as a winner. Small anecdote here, some researchers had submitted page-long programs that did extremely complicated reasoning, trying to exploit other agents and cooperate and whatnot. And in the end, a four-line program won the tournament, which consisted of Tit for Tat. Now let's see what our multi agent reinforcement learning algorithms do in this simple setting where we can have reciprocity. Perhaps to our great shock, naive reinforcement learning agents using DeepRL learn to defect in all states. This is shown by the plots on this slide. Shown is the probability of an agent to cooperate, for, for the probability of IS to cooperate on the x axis and the probability for Bob to cooperate on the y-axis. Each dot corresponds to one learning run in one specific state. So for example, if you look at the blue dot, this corresponds to the action that Alice and Bob take when in the previous step, both cooperated. Because we have four different states, the states are cooperate, 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 defect, defect, cooperate, and defect, defect. And obviously the initial state, no one has acted yet, right? So what we can see is that all of these points for the naive learner using the exact value function, the probability of Alice cooperating is low, near zero on the x-axis, but also the probability of Bob cooperating is low, near zero on the y-axis. This leads to expected returns shown on the top right on this slide of minus two. Here's some interesting things that's happening. Alice and Bob are maximizing the true value function and the function of their parameters. And yet, the average reward is plummeting from minus 1.5 to minus 2. This means that both Alice and Bob are spending two years on average in prison per time step in this iterated game. And you can think of this as being the analog of cars crashing against each other on the road. In contrast, when we look at Lola agents, a very different picture emerges. Let's start by analyzing the red points. The red points are in the bottom left corner. Red corresponds to both Alice and Bob defecting DD in the previous state. Now let's see what Alice and Bob are going to do in the next state. Bottom left corner means that both the x-axis, which is the probability of Alice cooperating, is zero, but also the y-axis, the probability of Bob cooperating, is zero. This means when both agents cooperate, defected in the previous round, they will both defect again in the next round. The green points are in the bottom right corner. Green corresponds to Alice defecting against Bob in the previous round and Bob cooperating with Alice. The bottom right means that now Alice has a probability of one of cooperating while Bob being with, at zero on the y-axis has a probability of 0% of cooperating on the next move. That's interesting. So when we had DD, we get DD again. When we had DC, we now get CD, cooperate defect. Let's look at the yellow points. The yellow points in the top left quadrant of the middle plot correspond to a state whereby Alice cooperated and Bob defected. In the next move, Alice, the yellow points being most in the top left corner, has a 0% probability of cooperating, while Bob has a 100% probability of cooperation. This means we're moving from cooperate defect to defect for Alice, cooperate for Bob. If this rings the bell, then you're exactly right. This corresponds to tit for tat. The Lola agents, rather than learning to defect against each other, like the naive learners, have learned to reciprocate. And this leads to an average return of minus one in this game, as shown on the right-hand side. Now, to be clear, we did not tell these Lola agents about reciprocity. We did not hard code tit for tat. We randomly initialized the policies, and we started learning under the Lola learning rule. And what happened, to our great surprise, was that these agents discovered a way to reciprocate with each other, learning tit for tat, leading to one year in prison on average. In the bottom row, we find that the same results hold when we're using policy gradients, when we're estimating the gradients using samples coming from the environment. Obviously, there is more noise due to the variance of the gradient estimators and the higher order terms, 
but the same qualitative picture emerges as shown in the bottom left. Being encouraged by the findings on the iterative prisoner's dilemma, we moved on to test our luck on one more game, which is called Matching Pennies. Matching Pennies is the game theoretician's version of rock, paper, scissors. In Matching Pennies, both others involved have to choose head or tails, but the, the, the twist is that Alice wants to choose the same as Bob. Alice receives one point when Bob and her choose head, or Bob and her choose tail, while Bob wants to do the opposite of Alice. So Bob loses the point when they do the same. In this game, even in the iterated setting, there is a single Nash equilibrium, which is for everyone to play 50-50 head or tail. To our surprise, naive learners did not learn the Nash equilibrium. Instead, they learned to play deterministic strategies that are extremely unstable over the course of learning. So what we find here is, in this setting, naive learning does not converge. Instead, Alice and Bob go around in circles, and that's indicated by the great amount of variance in the return as shown on the right-hand side plot. In contrast, the Lola agents converge stably to 50-50 to Nash, that being the only point where no agent can improve the, their return by changing their policy. This makes intuitive sense. The naive learner assumes that if Alice ever plays a strategy of 60-40, then Alice will do so forever. Therefore, Bob is incentivized to immediately play 0-100. Obviously, if Bob plays 0-100, they're mostly playing tail then Alice can next step exploit this by playing Z100 herself. The Lola agent, in contrast, anticipates that while they could exploit the deviation from Nash, this would yield them more exploitable in the next step of learning. And therefore, the Lola agent prefers to play the Nash policy. This leads to a stable return, as shown on the right-hand side, indicated by the less shading on the plot. We also found that the same holds under the sample gradients without drugs of the, of the value function. Obviously, once again, we see no noise. Now, we can evaluate these results quantitatively by counting how many of the points on the plot are in the correct quadrant compared to tit for tat for the IPD, the trade prisons dilemma, but also compared to the Nash policy of playing 50-50 in iterated matching pennies. And what we find, highlighted here in red, is that when the Lola agents have access to the exact value function, 80% of the learning outcomes are consistent with it for that. In contrast, the naive learners only have 20% of points consistent with it for that. And those 20% of points really simply correspond to the fact that the naive learners play defect defect in the bottom left quadrant when they're both defective. There's nothing magical going on here. They are just defecting. We also find that in the matching pennies, 98% of the points for the lower exact agent uh, are in the Nash quadrant, while none of the naive learners learn to play Nash in this setting. And similar results hold for the policy gradient version of our algorithms. While this was great, we also decided to run a tournament where we pitched the Lola agents against a whole set of different agents from multi-agent learning, where we trained them in pairs and we looked at the average reward per step that these agents get when interacting, learning in conjunction with a large number of other learning mechanisms. This includes joint action learners, JL, policy hill climbing, we don't learn fast policy hill climbing, and obviously the naive learners using the exact value function, but also the Lola agents using the exact value function. And what we found is that indeed in the round robin tournament, the Lola agent managed to incentivize all other agents to cooperate, to reciprocate, leading to an average return of minus one point. And that was by far the highest reward we observed for any of the learning algorithms here. In matching pennies, the result was less clear, but we didn't really expect to uh, get positive returns since really this is a zero-sum game and all we can hope for is stability in the learning outcomes. So, so far, we've dropped the assumption of having access to the true value function and the true gradients by estimating those. But next, we want to move away from the, from the assumption that we have the true weight of the opponent. So we'll engage in opponent modeling, which we're calling Lola OM. In Lola OM, rather than having theta 2, the true weight of the opponent, we're estimating theta 2, we're estimating theta 2 using maximum likelihood. 
And uh, just a brief reminder here, uh, IMP is iterated matching pennies, and IPD is iterated prisoner's dilemma. There was a question coming in. Thank you for that. Uh, so we est we're estimating theta 2 using a maximum likelihood estimate where we're trying to maximize the probability of the, of the observed actions from the opponent given the states. That's called a point estimate, and it gives us a theta 2 hat, which is just our guess for what the opponent policy might be. And we're not going to throw away the true axis of theta 2 and instead use theta 2 hat. We'll also move to a setting whereby we have to use recurrent policies and true deep reinforcement learning because we have a great world in which agents have to collect coins. These coins provide one point for any agent that picks it up. There's blue and red coins. However, whenever an agent picks up a coin of the opposing color, the opposing agent loses two points. So in the top left quadrant, the blue agent picks up the red coin, gaining one point. The red agent gets one point for picking up a coin. However, because the blue agent picked up the red coin, the red agent loses two points. That leads to plus one minus two, minus one point in total for the red agent in this result. Now, because there's both blue and red coins, the same scenario here can be redone with blue coins. And this means that if every agent picks up any coin, there will be zero points on average for every agent. In this setting, reciprocating, cooperating, and defecting no longer correspond to one state in the game. Instead, you have to observe the action observation history of each agent or decide if the agent is cooperating or not. To model this, we have used recurrent deep neural networks that can encode entire trajectories. And we've used LOLA in conjunction with these deep recurrent policies. I also had a question coming in here. What is U and S in the previous expressions? U is always the action in our settings, and S is always the state. Right, so here, let's go back to support modeling just to be clear. Um, U is the action, U2 is the actions that the opponent took given the state of the game. And we're trying to maximize the probabilities of these actions by adjusting the parameters of the policy that we're estimating theta. So what we find, perhaps to our surprise, is that even when using recurrent policies, we can still use LOLA in order to establish reciprocity amongst the learning agents. In particular, naive learning using policy gradients, the same recurrent networks, the agents learn, learn to pick up their coins with a probability of 50%, as shown on the left. That's the orange line. This leads to zero points on average, because while you can pick up your own coin, you can also get penalized for the opponent picking up their coin, your coin. However, if we use LOLA with true access to the problems of the, of, the, of the opponent using the LOLA policy gradient method, then in fact, the the agents have a probability of 85% of picking up their own coin. And this leads to returns of 16 points across the episode. And we find that even when we have to model the opponent, we still get 65% probability of picking up our own coin, which leads to non-negative returns to positive returns on the right-hand side. That's the LOLO M line, where LOLO M stands for LOLO opponent modeling. Now, I had a fantastic question coming in here. Uh, don't we assume that we have access to the architecture? Yes. So, so far, we've assumed that we, while we don't know the weights, we do have access to the architecture. And it would be fantastic if you're interested in this, if you want to rerun the experiments using a different architecture. And my guess is that it would still work, that you could most likely still establish uh, reciprocity emerging in these learning settings, even using different architectures. But that's really an interesting question to follow up here. But all the code is online. We will get to that later. So far in Lola, we have assumed that the other agent is a naive learner. However, we do know that in self-play, my opponent is also a LOLA agent. This means that we can think about a second order LOLA agent that doesn't assume a naive learner as the opponent, but another LOLA agent. And because the LOLA agent has second order gradients, this high order LOLA will have third order gradients and so on. And if we're doing this, we can now ask, how does it pay off to be a second order LOLA agent when playing against the LOLA agent? So that's shown on this side. We're looking at what happens when we pitch a naive learner using the exact value function or LOLA learner against a number of different versions on the, in, in the columns, naive learner, LOLA, and so on. And what we find is that indeed, LOLA playing against LOLA achieves the best result in the iterated prisoner's dilemma. One year in prison average, 1.04 years in prison average. Obviously, naive learners support terribly against each other. They get two years in prison. However, the LOLA agent can actually exploit the naive learner. That's indicated by the um, LOLA exact playing against naive learning exact. 
where the lower agent gets 1.3 years in prison and the naive learner gets 1.5 years in prison, spending more time in prison. In contrast, the second order Lola agent playing against the exact Lola agent cannot exploit the Lola agent. They'll both spend about 1.1 years in prison. That's an interesting result because it suggests that there is no reason to go to ever higher orders of Lola learning. It suggests that indeed Lola playing against Lola might be a learning equilibrium where no agent is incentivized to try to exploit the other agent with more complicated learning algorithms. Let's talk a little about uh, what we've seen and achieved so far. Clearly, when we're doing deep multi-agent reinforcement learning, the previous state of the art methods can lead to defection in situations that require agents to reciprocate. In contrast, when we use LOLA, this leads to the emergence of reciprocity. Importantly, in those settings, the cooperation arises out of selfish interest by the agent rather than trying to optimize a common objective. Because the assumption here is that we cannot change the incentives or an objective of all agents. All we can do is we can change the learning rules such that the agents are smarter about achieving their goals, considering that other agents are also learning and updating their parameters. And this leads to the emergence of reciprocity. We also found that this works both in the exact setting where we have access to true gradients, the true value function, and true parameters, but it does also hold when we're using policy gradients. There's clearly a number of open challenges. So one question came in earlier. What happens when we don't know the update rules of the opponent? What happens when the opponent is trying to trick the Lola agent by having adversarial update rules? And also this hasn't been extended to partial observability. I just got another fantastic question coming in here, which was about second order Lola versus second order Lola. And indeed, we haven't run the experiments, but be aware that at that point, it's again a broken assumption, right? Because the second order Lola agent assumes that the first order, order Lola agent, that the opponent is the first order Lola agent, when indeed this other agent might be themselves a second order Lola agent, right? But that's another good experiment. Uh, the code is open source. You can probably just run this uh, Right now, if you're interested, we haven't run that experiment. I think it's a good data point to get. Good. I get another question coming in here. One second. Yeah, so that's a good question here. The question is, the goal of the agent is selfish, but they end up cooperating. And I use the word cooperating when really what I mean is reciprocating. These agents reciprocate. Because playing tit for tat, right? Let's go back to that little plot we had with the policies here. Playing tit for tat doesn't mean that you cooperate all the time, right? So this is really the key slide here. Um, let's look at this slide again. So if agents were cooperating in all states, you would see all the points in the top right corner, right? Playing cooperate, cooperate in the iterative presence dilemma, where you cooperate in all states, is a terrible strategy because any opponent can exploit that strategy by defecting against you, and then you'll spend three years in prison. So that's not a good strategy, right? And Lola agents, in fact, they don't play cooperate, cooperate. They don't cooperate to maximize the joint return. These Lola agents only cooperate when the other side is cooperating. So they play tit for tat. They, re they do what others did to them. They discovered the notion of reciprocation simply by accounting for the learning behavior of other agents in the environment. That's important. They're not just cooperating. They are playing a tit for tat policy that reciprocates rather than cooperates. It just so happens that when two agents are reciprocating, they're both playing tit for tat. They both start cooperating on the first move, and then they reciprocate on future moves. This leads to cooperation. And by the way, thank you for the questions. Uh, keep them coming in. Uh, so just another question here. What happens if you have multiple opponents? Fantastic question. I've shown you everything assuming two agents. Uh, so let's go back to that little slide where we have that little Lola illustration. But clearly, if it works for two, you can imagine that Alice is playing against a whole number of different bars, right? And in this case, all hap that happens is you have a number of different terms that emerge in the learning steps of all the other opponents, right? And mathematically, we now simply have to sum across all these different opponent terms that come in from everybody else. So the method is general. It's a general sum and play method.
that can be applied in any setting of any number of agents. If there's no more questions about uh, Lola itself, then I would like to show you some follow-up work we've done recently for how to do all of this using few computation resources using a new Monte Carlo estimator. But before we get there, one more question on Lola, which is how does Lola versus Lola result in learning? Well, <laughs> you know, this is, I have to be honest, Initially, this was somewhat surprising that they learned tit for tat, right? Because nothing here says that they should learn tit for tat policy. But what happens is, if we go back to that little picture of the agents and the gradient, um, you can think about the policy space of these agents of having different, as having different regions. When an agent defects against another agent, this means that that the agent is uh, actually causing harm in their learning to the opponent. However, Lola tries to find regions of the parameter space where the agents learn with the opponent. And that's really where learning happens, because these agents start trying to shape the learning of the opponent in a way that maximizes their own return after the opponent has, has learned. And in, that, and in that process, they end up maximizing uh, they end up maximizing something that leads to reciprocity. So I have another question coming in here, which is, have you tried out scenarios where the agents do not have the same reward? So in general, to be clear, this is a general sum method, so we have not assumed that the agents have the same reward. Right? So clearly, both Lola, both Alice and Bob, are maximizing their own return as a function of, the, of their own policy. Right? We're not assuming the same return for the two agents. And I think what the, question is, what the question might be talking about is a powerful agent versus a, a weaker agent. And we haven't played with the architectures. So what you could try and do is, if you had one agent that has a, has a, a bigger neural network playing against another agent that has a smaller neural network, right? if one agent is more capable than another agent, then potentially that might lead to more interesting learning outcomes here. Are there any more questions coming in? Because I think we won't have time. What I would love to talk about the next paper called DICE. I will just show you the title here so you can go and look it up online at some point. Um, this is a, an extension of a, of a new Monte Carlo estimator, which we published at ICML. And this you can use to re-implement Lola as a multi-agent learning algorithm that does meta-learning, whereby we can now simply use the magic of deep learning rather than Taylor expansion in order to account for the learning of other agents in the environment. This is the picture you should have in mind here, where uh, really we can now model the learning step directly as a, as a derivative of a new objective function with respect to the parameters theta, and we can now unroll the, 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 the policies after learning step. This is called Dice Lola. I highly recommend uh, to look at the paper. There's also a talk online. Um, take a look. It reduced the computation requirements for us drastically. All the results you've seen so far assumed a batch size of uh, 4,000 um, rollouts, which is rather computationally expensive. And here, using Dice Lola, we could go as low as having 64 entries in the batch, getting very similar results. So for Dice Lola, once again, uh, we find that the Lola agents indeed learn to reciprocate learning against, against in, in self-play. And also shown this plot here is uh, also shown this plot is the original. Is the original Lola at that same small, small batch size. And you can find that this new method, Dice Lola, actually does extraordinarily well in settings where you have less computational uh, capacity. And again, shown you on the plot is the, the, the naive learner doing very poorly, obviously minimizing the return as a, as a function of theta as training progresses. So if there are um, no more questions, let's, uh, let's get to the...
then uh, I would I would like to thank all of you um, um, for listening. Obviously, I would like to thank my my collaborators across uh, OpenAI and the University of Oxford, and obviously uh, thank you, Media, for organizing this and providing compute power. Uh, um, and uh, last but not least, a lot of you have been asking, there is code. The code for um, replicating all of this is at github.com slash ihdvat slash lola. This will have both the code for lola, the paper I showed first, but also lola dice. And the lola dice code you can run very quickly within a few minutes on your laptop. And you can also run the exact versions of the algorithm using the exact value function uh, very fast your laptop. So you can really play around with this code and contribute quickly. So I think just in this conversation, in this presentation, we've had three great ideas for doing follow-up research. So I, I thank you for that. Okay, go. All right, thank you all for attending today's webinar and thank you so much, Jacob, for presenting. As already mentioned, we have recorded this presentation and we'll have it available shortly on demand. You will receive an email with the link to this information soon. Additionally, any questions that were submitted but not answered, we will follow up with those uh, questions answered for you. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to being with you at our next event. Have a wonderful day.